Humanity's greatest journey begins not with a step, but with a leap. Aboard the starship Prometheus, pioneers prepare to bridge the vast emptiness between worlds. Prometheus to ground control. All systems are go. We're ready to make history. Across 54.6 million kilometers of cold space, five vessels carry the dreams of Earth. Athena, Apollo, Hercules, Orion, and Prometheus converging on a world that beckons with crimson allure. Athena to fleet, Mars is in sight. A new horizon unfolds before us. In unity, they descend. A ballet of engineering and hope, touching down on the alien soil of our neighbor. This is not the end of a journey, but the beginning of mankind's boldest adventure. Prometheus has landed. Athena, touchdown confirmed. Hercules, we're hunting. Apollo, boots on Mars. Orion, stable and ready. On this day, Mars is no longer a world of desolation, but a canvas of possibility. Welcome to our new frontier. Prometheus base to all units. Habitat module is secure. We're moving to life support setup. Apollo greenhouse to command. We have sprouts. I repeat, we have sprouts. Orion to Prometheus. We're losing solar efficiency fast. Apollo, we're losing our crop lights to power cuts. You need to fix this, or we'll face food shortages. All ships, Orion here. We can't let this storm break us. We are getting backup power online. Irradiation levels are surpassing our initial models. We need a viable solution to protect everyone. And I've been thinking about our water reserves. What's on your mind, Lena? Using water as a biological shield. It's not a new concept, but here it could be life-saving. Encasing our living quarters in water packs could drastically reduce radiation exposure from gamma rays and neutrons. That's an intriguing idea. But do we have enough water to create effective shielding around the habitats? It's ambitious. We'll need to use about half of our main water tank for each colony ship. It's a significant amount, but our recycling capabilities and hydroponics should keep us balanced. It's worth it if it keeps us safe. Half the main tank. All right, let's propose this to the other ships. If it can give us an edge against the radiation, it's a step we should take. In the vast and hostile expanse of space, radiation poses one of the greatest challenges to human survival on Mars. Recognizing this, Scientists and engineers have turned to an innovative solution steeped in both simplicity and scientific rigor, using water as a shield against the lethal embrace of cosmic rays and solar radiation. This concept, explored by NASA and various research institutions worldwide, leverages water's unique properties to safeguard future Martian colonists. Water, a molecule composed of two hydrogen atoms bonded to an oxygen atom, possesses an exceptional ability to absorb and scatter the high-energy particles that comprise cosmic radiation. Studies, such as those conducted by the Radiation Shielding Materials Assessment and Testing Project at NASA's Langley Research Center, have demonstrated water's efficacy in diminishing the intensity of gamma rays and neutrons, common components of space radiation that can penetrate deep into human tissue and spacecraft structures, causing significant harm.
Thank you, everyone, for joining this crucial discussion. Our mission faces a significant challenge with radiation, and it's imperative we collaborate on a solution. Dr. Lena, from our medical team, has proposed an innovative approach that I believe merits our collective consideration. Thank you, Commander Rachel. As we've observed, radiation levels are far exceeding our initial models, posing a serious risk to our health and the integrity of our mission. After reviewing our resources, I propose we utilize our water reserves as a biological shield. By encasing our living quarters in water packs, we can significantly reduce exposure to gamma rays and neutrons. It's a method grounded in extensive research and has shown promise in both terrestrial and spaceborne studies. It's a solid idea, Dr. Lena. Water is an excellent moderator for radiation, thanks to its hydrogen content. I'll need to assess our current water reserves to ensure the feasibility of implementing this on Orion. It's a considerable commitment of our reserves, but our projections indicate it's within our capacity, especially given our recycling system's efficiency. This could be a pivotal step in enhancing our protection. And there might be an opportunity to augment this strategy. Our recent discovery of rare Earth elements on Mars presents the potential for creating a strong electromagnetic field, a magnetic shield to complement Dr. Lena's water-based proposal. This could provide comprehensive protection against a broader spectrum of radiation. That's a fascinating possibility, Kim. Combining both methods could indeed offer us the best chance of minimizing radiation harm. I'm eager to see how we can integrate these solutions. Let's prioritize this. I'll oversee the refinement of the rare earth elements for the magnetic shielding. The synergy between Hercules's resources and Prometheus's water shield concept could set a new standard for radiation protection on Mars. Agreed. This collaborative effort embodies the spirit of our mission, innovation through unity. Let's move forward with urgency and precision. Dr. Lena, please continue working closely with our engineers and scientists to ensure the seamless integration of these shields. Thank you, everyone, for your commitment and insights. We'll coordinate closely to retrofit our habitats for the water shields and develop the magnetic shielding components. This is a breakthrough moment for us all. A good solution to these issues can be 3D printing. This technology allows us to construct habitat structures directly on the Martian surface, using regolith, the very soil beneath our feet, as the primary building material. The process involves robotic printers that layer regolith mixed with a binding agent, creating walls and domes designed to withstand Mars's harsh environment. The significance of 3D printing extends beyond the logistical advantage of using in situ resources. It plays a crucial role in shielding inhabitants from the relentless barrage of cosmic radiation and solar flares that characterize the Martian surface. Unlike Earth, Mars lacks a protective magnetic field and thick atmosphere, leaving it exposed to high levels of space radiation that pose serious risks to human health, including increased cancer risk and potential damage to the central nervous system. 3D printed structures on Mars incorporate designs that specifically address these radiation concerns. Walls can be printed with a thickness and density optimized for radiation attenuation, effectively absorbing and deflecting harmful particles. Moreover, the incorporation of specialized materials into the print mixture such as hydrogen-rich polymers or elements like boron can enhance the radiation shielding properties of the habitats. These materials are adept at capturing neutrons and mitigating the impact of cosmic rays. Kim, got a minute? Just got word. Our 3D building printer's delayed. Again, that's twice now. That's frustrating. We are stretching our current resources thin as it is. The printer would accelerate constructing radiation-proof habitats. Exactly my thought. Our shielding is a patchwork without it. We need real shielding. Let's keep pushing with what we have. I'll see if there's any alternative tech we can repurpose for now. Stay strong, Marco. Dr. Lena, there's another complication. Even if we had the bioreactors and cultures intact, our current water reserves are too precious for soil washing. We can't afford to use what little we have on perchlorate removal. 
That's a stark reality, Marco. Water is life here, quite literally. And without it, our options for making the Martian soil safe for agriculture are severely limited. Doctor, considering our constraints with water usage for soil remediation, I've been revisiting the application of zero-valent iron, ZVI, for in-situ chemical reduction. Its efficacy in degrading a wide array of contaminants, including perchlorates, could be pivotal here. Have you considered the reduction pathways and the byproducts in a reduced atmospheric pressure environment? Absolutely, that's been a major consideration. The typical synthesis route for ZVI involves the reduction of iron oxide with hydrogen, which we can generate via electrolysis of water, a process we're already familiar with for oxygen production. However, the implications of deploying ZVI on Mars hinge on controlling the reaction kinetics and ensuring the byproducts don't adversely affect our closed habitats. The question then becomes one of processing scale and the energy requirements for such an undertaking. Precisely. I'm proposing a pilot project to assess the feasibility of localized ZVI production, starting with a small-scale synthesis to study the reaction efficiency. If successful, this could lead to a scalable solution for soil remediation that bypasses our current water usage limitations. I'll start assembling a task force. In the heart of humanity's endeavor on Mars, a conversation between seasoned professionals unfolds, a struggle of experience and innovation. As they consider the application of zero-valent iron for soil decontamination, their discourse reveals the challenges. This is science at the frontier, where every question answered unfolds a new layer of inquiry, driving the colony closer to self-sufficiency on the Red Planet. There comes a troubling whisper from the Void. Recent reports indicate complications with the critical resupply mission, the one tasked with delivering the much-anticipated nuclear reactor, vital for powering our dreams on this distant world. This setback could cast a long shadow over the colony's aspirations, reminding us that in the grand expanse of space, the path to progress is fraught with uncertainty.